One, about six years ago, my girlfriend was house-sitting for a teacher friend of hers. It was a real nice house in the mountains. Can't remember exactly what the husband did, but much better than a teacher's salary. My girlfriend called me one night. She was house-sitting at a different location and asked me when the restaurant closed if I wouldn't mind running over and letting the dogs out. I had only been there during the day, and I knew they had a hot tub, and after a long day of work I figured that's exactly what I could use. My last customer of the night tipped me a single mushroom cap. One, that's it. I decided I would eat the one cap and drive over, hop in the hot tub for an hour and leave. It was about a half hour drive, and I left the bar at 10.15ish after I closed up. I had eaten the cap around 10, thinking if I do feel anything, it will be kicking in about the time I got there. Along the way, I realize I have to stop for gas. I'm a little worried they may kick in while I'm in the car, but nothing happened. I remember thinking, well, that sucks. This didn't work. As I entered the doorway with all the lights off in the house, I can only describe as the strongest weight I've ever felt, like pure gravity slamming me to the ground. Here is where it gets really weird. Goosebumps coursing through me as I write this. I was on the ground in the pitch black except for the glow of the fish tank, and to my left was five or six dead kids in a pile next to me. I tried crawling away but could barely move at all. When I was able to crawl a little bit, I looked up to my left, and there was an old 50s television with an antenna that had never been there before, suddenly turned on. There was no television when we went back the next day. On the television, there was a man dressed like the man in the yellow hat from Curious George, and he kind of looked like him as well. Except, the man was dressed in all green, and had on a green hat, kind of like the one Smokey the Bear wears. He was holding a little white dog and telling the kids it was okay to pet it while staring directly at me. Then the television suddenly turned off. I had no strength at all, and was trying to crawl out the back door, Right before I made it back there, there was a hooded black mass by the basement stairs, and for some reason, I kept seeing the word Sherpa in big red letters flashing in front of my face. It wanted me to follow it down the stairs, and my body wanted to follow, but my brain was screaming at me to get the hell out. Finally, I was able to reach the back patio door, knock the stick that was holding it closed, and get to the back porch. As soon as I was outside, my strength was returned. I look at my phone. It was 2.48 in the morning. I had been in there four hours, and it felt like 20 minutes. I later found out the two dogs they had both died a few months later, and the two-year-old pup died of a brain aneurysm. The youngest of the two boys ended up trying to cut his wrists. He was in seventh grade. There was an evil in that house for sure. When we went back the next day, no TV where I saw one, and definitely no dead kids. 2. I, 22 female, had a very horrible experience about two or three years ago. My boyfriend, 22, and I had been dating for less than a year when this happened. My partner is of Latino descent, and I am white. My boyfriend's family are believers of the mal de ojo bracelets, or in English, the evil eye. They taught me that the evil eye in their culture is used for protection, like if someone gives you a bad look. Or if... They look at you with bad intent or envy. Then they taught me that if the bracelet becomes lost or broken, that means that the bracelet has done its job and protected you. My partner and I were hanging out one day at his home when he came across an old evil eye bracelet that used to belong to him. He had lost the bracelet some time before. He asked me if I wanted it, and he said that it would protect me. From what I understand, someone can gift you their evil eye bracelet, and it should still protect you, even though it had a previous owner. I accepted my boyfriend's offer and decided to wear the bracelet. But I didn't really believe in that stuff. I grew up Christian, and I still believe in God to this day, and I am fairly religious. I went home later that day, and I was living with my aunt and uncle at the time. My aunt and uncle are very hardcore religious, so their house felt beyond safe most of the time. I never got any bad energy or negative feelings there, nor did I ever experience anything bad or paranormal there. That night I went to bed wearing the bracelet, with nothing really in my mind. 
I don't know how long I had been asleep for or what time I woke up, but I remember waking up screaming and thrashing. I can't remember any previous nightmare or dream prior to waking, but as I was waking myself up with my screaming and thrashing, I swear I felt something grab my arm. The arm that I was wearing the bracelet on. I remember that I was grabbing my own arm as well with my other hand, almost as if I was trying to reinforce my other arm that was being grabbed. I think I had managed to shake off whatever was grabbing me at the time, because as I was really waking up, I suddenly felt something at the end of the bed, and a hard tug. It tried to rip my blanket off me. I held on to my blanket firmly and eventually it let go. I lay there in the pitch black darkness with my eyes wide open, just staring at the ceiling until I felt it was safe enough to grab my remote control that turned my LED light strips on and off. I turned on the lights and saw nothing at all. I stayed awake for maybe 10 minutes, just looking around and being on my phone. I fell asleep again. I don't know how I was able to, but I did, with the lights on, of course. I had never, ever experienced anything like this, and there's no way I could have been asleep or dreaming still, because I distinctly remember waking up screaming and thrashing, and absolutely feeling something. Now, I don't know if something had been attached to that bracelet, or if it was just crazy coincidence or not, but it was terrifying, and I didn't feel comfortable going home the next day to sleep in my own bed again. The bracelet remained in my home, but... I had taken it off to shower and did not put it back on. I never experienced anything like that again, even though the bracelet remained in my home in my jewelry dish. If any of you practice witchcraft or into the paranormal and culturally practice and believe in the mal de ojo or evil eye, I'd like to hear your thoughts or speculations as to what you think could have happened. 3. So I've been contemplating posting this story for a while now, due to how speaking about it seems to rile it back up, but I think it's worth getting my experience out for y'all to hear. My friend, her cousin, and I went to the old Alton Bridge a total of three times. While en route to the bridge, you go through a pretty remote part of Denton, with nothing but trees on both sides and the road ahead of you. Shortly before arrival, we noticed an odd amount of roadkill, at the time, we didn't think much of it due to the area. Now it could just be a coincidence, but as I continue on, there will be an affinity to the numbers 3, triple 3, and triple 6. With that said, we saw three carcasses on the way there. Once you drive on the gravel parking lot, you have to pass over what I believe was a small white vehicle barrier to access the trail to the bridge. Over the barrier, we noticed a steep drop in temperature the moment we passed into the woods. As you continue down the trail, there's a bench and table to your left under the canopy of trees, and right after that, you have the old Alton Bridge. It was around the time we got to the bridge that I felt a strange disconnect with myself. My thoughts don't feel like my own, and I felt something drawing me to go deeper into the woods past the bridge. We proceeded deeper in, and once again noticed another drop in temperature. This time it was almost chilly. It was quite a jarring difference, considering how hot and humid it was before entering the woods. Around this time, I began to feel strangely comfortable in the otherwise creepy woods. My thoughts felt more and more disconnected from myself and became more chaotic and cloudy. I had an urge to be destructive and use drugs. Prior to this, I had about four or five months sober, if I recall correctly. Later that night, I relapsed and continued using throughout the next two visits. The second time, I wasn't present, but I can recount my friend and her cousin's experience. After arriving, they noticed a bit of commotion in the woods, and saw three people walking through the woods past the bridge. When approaching the bridge, they saw a set of glowing red eyes and heard a large growl in the bushes. Then on the way out, going back to the car, they noticed what they believed to be pig blood covering the windshield. They were pretty spooked, but just wrote it off as they had seen that group of three earlier, and they were likely the culprits. Now, the third and final visit is when this all comes to a head. This time, all three of us go. Once again, we notice the strange drop in temperature, 
and I'm back in that weird headspace. We decided this time to bring a Ouija board and ask the name of the spirit. Now I firmly believe this name holds a lot of power, so I won't say it or even type it, but I'll give y'all a hint. It's the first name of the founder of Apple. We asked a few other questions that I can't recall to the brain fog, but I do remember when we got answers they didn't make any sense. It was spell M-N-M-N, -N -N, in a constant loop, making a rainbow motion, completely disregarding our questions. We later found out this is a bad sign indicating the spirit you're communicating with is trying to escape the board or open a portal, if you will. After that, we proceeded back to the bench and table by the entrance to regroup. On the way there, my friend notices her back burns. We pull our flashlights to observe and notice three distinct scratches on her back. When we notice another set of three develop on her arms, upper back, and neck before our eyes, we couldn't debunk the scratches as any one of us or a branch doing it since we had a clear trail. After this, we made it to the bench and have a seat, then notice the distinct smell of rotten eggs or sulfur. My friend begins to act differently at this point as well. She is constantly spacing out or acting nothing like herself. Prior to arriving, she wanted to say a protection prayer that she found on Google to help keep us safe, but at this point was cursing God and refusing to acknowledge her belief before. She wanted to go back to the woods and stay the night, and challenge the spirit to show itself. Her cousin and I were pretty spooked at this point and realized it would be best to leave. After a bit of an argument, she agrees to leave with us, not saying a word the entire walk to her car. The smell of rotten eggs persists as we enter the car, but we still write it off, probably because we don't want to admit what's going on. On the way to her cousin's house, she still won't say a word as she drives. She then begins to speed, almost hitting 100 miles per hour, which was way out of character for her, as she's otherwise a safe driver, especially when driving my car. After telling her multiple times to slow down, she snaps out of it briefly to acknowledge us, and with a bit of an argument slows back down. We tried talking about the experience we all just had, and she would only add stuff like, Maybe I'll invite it in my head. God isn't real, and I want to go back tomorrow and stay the whole night. It was at this point I realized beyond a doubt something had a hold of her. We arrive at her cousin's to drop him off, and still note the smell of rotten eggs following us inside his house. We try to debunk it and check the fridge for hard-boiled eggs on the off chance. It's just a coincidence, but to no avail. My friend is still steadfast on her newly acquired beliefs, and I begins cursing the Bible without us even bringing it up. Her and I leave her cousin's house at this point to return back to my house. However, I don't have any intention on dragging whatever is affecting her back to where I lay my head. I quickly shuffle with my phone while driving in circles about ten minutes from our destination to find a prayer or anything that can rid her of what had come over her. I find that using in the name of Jesus Christ you will leave in three different variations is supposed to work, but typically only a priest is successful. We didn't have any priests available at three in the morning, so I'd have to do. I repeated it in the name of Jesus back to back to back, until I was literally yelling with everything in me over her snark remarks rebuking God. Eventually she burps. One of those roaring, drawn-out, layered burps, and the smell from this was of rotten eggs, but ten times more potent than what we were smelling before. So I rolled all the windows down immediately to clear this putrid stench while crinkling my nose when she burst out laughing at me. She was back like nothing had changed, like the past three or four hours didn't even happen. In fact, for her, they didn't because she didn't remember any of it. We made it back to my house, and for the most part, the worst of it was over. The next day, we both sat down and agreed to start reading the Bible after our experience, but as soon as we began reading it, that strange cloudy headspace would come over us, albeit not as strong as before, but it was definitely there. We both could acknowledge what happened now, and decided to reach out to an exorcist located not even five minutes from my house. 
A couple of weeks pass before we make it there to further discuss our findings at the old Alton Bridge. In the meantime, we continue our day-to-day -day lives. I'm picking up my usual pack of cigarettes from the store, and that's when I notice the cost of the pack. Six dollars and sixty-six cents. That's pretty weird, because not even two days before, they were five dollars seventy, or whatever the price of Marlboro Blacks was at the time. I saved the receipt to show to my friend. At another point, we were talking about what happened, and I look at my odometer and notice it landed right at 174666. That could obviously be written off as just a coincidence. The timing was really damning. We make it to the exorcist and speak to him about the bridge. He tells us he's familiar with what we experienced, since he's been there multiple times with Krups, and had similar results, albeit not as dramatic as ours. He tells us the demon by name and says he's something like a general in Satan's army. He mentioned there was far more than one demon in those woods and the one we encountered was ancient. He dismissed the fact that I cast out whatever was affecting my friend that night. And maybe he's right, maybe we got lucky, but I still feel I played a significant role in it. From there, things went back to normal for a couple of weeks. My friend returned to work until one day... She had an extremely bad panic attack, and had to come by. She told me she still felt it was affecting her, and it freaked her out. We go for a drive while I try to calm her down. As we're coming down a side street in my neighborhood, a car backs out of the driveway, almost hitting us in the process. We honk to let him know he almost hit us until we notice the car is just sitting in front of us and no one's in it. That's weird. We go to the house knock on the door and let the guy know what happened, and he's just as confused as we are. He tells us it's a manual and maybe he forgot his parking brake until he went to move it and his parking brake was on. Things like that can happen, I suppose, but this is adding up to be a lot of coincidences. That just about sums it up, though. There were a couple of more minor instances where I'd see the numbers on billboards at the same time I was talking to friends about it. But for the most part, I have been free of it, and last I spoke to my friend, she became a born-again Christian and is leading a good life. 4. This all happened a long time ago, when I was living with my dad around the age of 17, but I still remember it like it was yesterday. Dad had recently bought a townhouse in the city, and I had gotten my own room on the second floor. It was a rectangular room with a single window opposite the door. Once he walked in, there was a tall bookcase straight ahead protruding from the left-hand wall, with my bed right next to it. To your right, there was a corner desk with my computer, along with the right-hand wall. There was a keyboard, standing next to an old swivel chair that I inherited from my grandparents. I had never felt anything off about my room prior to the events I'm about to tell you. And all of this occurred over the span of about a week or two. Everything started with a feeling of being watched. You know that creepy sensation crawling up your skin, hair standing on end, making your muscles tense, and your heartbeat speed up? It happened late at night, when I had crawled into bed after turning off the light, and the room somehow felt a bit colder than usual. So I pulled up my duvet to cover the tip of my nose, while willing whatever was in my room to go away. After some time had passed, the feeling of being watched completely vanished, and I could finally fall asleep. But the sensation returned that following night. In fact, it started happening every night, relentlessly building in the intensity, until I could distinctly feel the presence of someone sitting in the chair opposite my bed watching me. It was without a doubt the presence of a man, but I still tried to deny it. To will his presence away. But it was as if the more I resisted, the more he wanted to make himself known. Then the chair started moving on its own, spinning gently from side to side. And there was no way for me to deny it any longer. Something, or rather someone, was in my room, and he wasn't alive. The exact moment I admitted it to myself, the moment I asked who he was, what he wanted, the chair stopped moving. He had gotten up, and I could feel him walking toward me. The air growing ever so slightly colder with each step. 
Once he was standing right beside my bed, I had already pulled the duvet up all the way over my head. What happened next, though, was really weird. I stopped feeling afraid. Stunned by the realization, I slowly pulled the duvet back down, only to be surprised by the sight of a young and very handsome man standing next to me. He reached out to touch my cheek. It was a really odd thing because I could actually feel his soft fingers on my skin. Yet at the same time, it did not feel entirely real. I remember asking again who he was, why he was there. But he only smiled and told me that he simply wanted to see me again before he left. Although I knew for a fact that I hadn't met him before. Yet at the same time, he did somehow feel familiar. As if we had known each other before. When I wasn't who I am now. It was the strangest feeling. When I studied his face, the look in his eyes filled with something I could only describe as love. But it was the kind of love you harbor for your significant other. He also looked young, in his twenties, which made me a bit concerned, so I asked if he had been around that age when he died. He smiled again and told me no, he had lived a long, happy life and died an old man. He simply appeared as his younger version of his former self because he thought I would feel more comfortable with that. It was such an odd conversation, looking back. But then, something even more strange happened. Once we had finished our conversation, he told me it was his time to go. I was still laying in my bed, the bookcase right behind my head in a completely dark room, when suddenly a warm, bright light lit up the darkness from behind me. It was as if someone had captured the sun and put it in my bookcase. Then he was simply gone. I never felt his presence ever again after that night. And I have never experienced anything else like this since. 5. I grew up in rural Nebraska. And as our house was quite old, we had had a number of unusual occurrences. I'm an adult now, but I wanted to make sure I wrote down these memories before the slow march of time fades them away. Please enjoy my childhood ghost stories. When I was seven years old, my family moved from suburban Omaha to the countryside of northern Nebraska, the same region where my father was born and raised. We purchased an old homestead built in the 1800s and renovated it to fit our growing family. I remember being amazed when my dad showed me the ancient logs they had extracted from the walls while remodeling the home, proving the incredible age of the structure. Dad held on to the logs, and I believe they're still in a shed somewhere on the property. When the house was finally ready for us to move in, no activity immediately began, at least to my knowledge. Being an amalgamation of an old cabin, a farmhouse, a bungalow, and then a modern construction, the house became something of a labyrinth to navigate. And so it was easy to get spooked when retrieving a can of tomato preserves from the basement, or trying to find the bathroom at night in the long hallways. But I don't remember anything particularly paranormal until after we'd lived there for a fair amount of time. I was ten when my youngest sister was born, and as infants are prone to waking up several times a night, my other two sisters and I shared a bedroom. We had bunk beds and a toddler bed all in one room. I slept on the top bunk, and often my younger sister below me would get scared in the middle of the night, get out of bed, and ask my dad to lie down on the floor beside her until she fell asleep. He'd reluctantly comply almost every time, and so often I saw the top of my dad's head go past the top bunk as he led my sister back to bed. However, I remember one night seeing the top of his head go past my bed, and not more than a moment later... I looked over the edge to watch my dad put my sister back in bed, only to find my sister fast asleep and my dad nowhere to be found. Initially, I was confused, but then I remembered that I didn't hear any footsteps when I saw the head pass by, and my dad is a rather noisy walker, even when he's trying to be quiet. But in my young mind, I had chalked it up to seeing things that weren't there, and forgot about it. At least until my mom started asking me if I had ever experienced anything odd in the house. My mother would ask me this after I reported to her that I had seen a woman in our house that I didn't know. Because the homestead was so remote. 
we'd often have to rise before the sun in order to catch the bus to school. So in the dark early morning, I'd brush my teeth and change into my school clothes, and as I was turning to leave the bathroom to get some breakfast, I saw a woman with brown hair, the features of her face obscured, dressed in a white flowing dress. I initially didn't do a double take, as I thought maybe my mom, who also has brown hair, maybe stepped into the bathroom without my hearing, as I'd left the door open while I brushed my teeth. But a strange feeling overtook me, and I did look back no more than a moment after seeing her and the woman was gone. The apparition had completely vanished. I staggered backwards out of the bathroom into the hallway, almost more confused than scared, but frightened nonetheless. I told my dad and then my mom when I got home from school. That's when she asked if I had experienced anything else that might be paranormal, or as she called it, spiritual. So I told her about the woman in white, as well as the shadow I'd seen past my bed. But then there was one other story I'd almost forgotten about, and one that she'd forgotten also. It wasn't more than a few months earlier that I was in my dad's makeshift basement office, doing homework on the only desktop computer our family owned, when I heard a voice behind me. Uh, some nice work, Sonny, the voice said, and pretty clearly I recognized it as my grandmother. Great-grandma Alice lived a few miles up the road on a farm of her own, and so it was pretty common that she'd visit. Thanks, Grandma, I mumbled, engrossed in my work. I finished a little while later, and coming back upstairs, I asked my mom if Grandma Alice had already gone home. She looked at me quizzically and said that Grandma had never been over. I told her that I just heard her voice downstairs. You must be hearing things, she said, returning to the food that she was preparing for dinner. While my mother was dismissive at the time, when she asked if I'd ever experienced anything spiritual in the house, she began taking notes listing off everything I'd seen and heard. I guess there's something of a spiritual sensitivity that runs in her side of the family. She, as well as my grandparents, have several stories of ghostly and demonic encounters that I'd love to share in further posts. I have another story that took place in that house rather recently that I'm compelled to share, but it's incredibly personal, and it's an experience of my mother's, not mine. As a child, my deathly fear of ghosts became a fascination, and still, as an adult, I love hearing a good ghost story. Now, twenty-some-odd years later, my wife is pregnant with our first child, and I'm eager to see if my family's sensitivity passes to our baby as well. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Paranormal Stories, episode 395. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, please hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already done so. Sorry if I sound a little rough today, it's just one of those weeks that happens. Uh, thankfully, after today, I can rest my voice a little bit. Okie dokie. Um, don't think we have any other business today, so let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And uh, Today's question is, when you have a sore throat, what is your remedy? What do you do to soothe it to get you going? Uh, in my situation, whenever my throat's sore, I kind of just need to, um, I need to keep talking so I can't just rest my voice, usually. Uh, so what I usually do is I use something called Throat Coat T. Uh, there are other companies that make similar products, but the one I use is Throat Coat T. Um, I think it's traditional medicinals that make that. But as I say, there are other companies that make similar things because they're not paying me to promote them. I just, I like that one. And I'll usually put a little bit of honey in it. And a couple of cups of that through a recording session usually gets me through. But I am I'm open to other answers, so let me know what you think in a comment below. Now before we go, let's have a look at the answer of the day from a previous video. And today's answer comes from Paranormal Stories 393. Uh, I think I messed the numbers up a little on some of those, but I've, I've at least corrected the thumbnails and titles now. Uh, so 393, and I think this was about your favourite conspiracy theory. And today's comes from... I am a Uniwolf. Uh, Jimi Hendrix didn't die. He's Morgan Freeman. Well, that's just going from excellent to excellent, isn't it? Thank you very much for your answer. I am a Uniwolf. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening. And take very good care of yourselves. <laughs>